renewable energy isn't really the newest of ideas. Hey, I'm Jay, you're watching Plasma Channel. Now, throughout history, our ability to utilize environmental energy to do work is one of the things that's advanced our civilization. Honestly, if you think about it, it kind of continues to define us. One power source in particular, though, has aided us for thousands of years. Wind power. From humble beginnings pushing boats, it now involves modern marvels which can power an entire town. This is a renewable energy source that powers millions of homes in the United States alone. In fact, Puget Sound Energy, one of Washington State's energy providers, owns a large wind power generation site just a few hours from where I live. Their site can power up to 180,000 homes alone. Luckily, after realizing that I love energy as much as they do, Puget Sound Energy invited me out for a private tour of their wind power facility over in Ellensburg, Washington. It was a mind-blowing experience with mega machines that I really wanted to share with you. So hopefully after this video, you have a new appreciation for wind power. Let's go. Arriving at the site, I was greeted by the team, which consisted of another content creator and two employees of PSE. Hi, I'm Janet Kim with Puget Sound Energy. I am the supervisor of external communications. Hi, I'm Andrea Crawford. I am the program coordinator here at the Wild Horse Wind Facility outside of Ellensburg, Washington. After suiting up in protective gear, we walked up to the visitor center where Andrea hooked us with a pretty great intro. We have 149 turbines here and each one produces 1.8 megawatts of power. If these turn on at nine miles an hour, they make increasing amounts of power until 28 mile an hour winds, and then they cut off at 56 mile per hour winds. But this is home to a lot of different animals. Um, this is winter range for the Rocky Mountain elk herd that comes through here. Uh, we have mule deer here during the summertime. You could probably tell from the audio that it was pretty windy there, but Wild Horse is also built in a spot that's really sunny. So essentially at that location, wind and solar go hand in hand, which is brilliant. In fact, right next to the visitor center is a massive solar display that both powers the visitor center and acts as a small sampling for a really massive solar display they have on a hill nearby. And that display puts out over 500 kilowatts of power. That power both goes into feeding the energy grid and also into the cooling equipment that's on the tops of all the windmills, but I'll touch on that later. We were one of the first uh, wind and solar combination facilities in the United States. Um, and when the large solar array on top of the mountain was built, it was the largest in the Pacific Northwest. So at that time, it was a research and development project because solar was quite a bit more expensive than wind. Of course, the real heroes at Wild Horse are the turbines themselves. After a lengthy three-year environmental study, PSE placed 149 turbines in specific locations which maximize energy while reducing environmental impact, which is groovy. These turbines are engineering masterpieces. Built by a company called Vestas, each windmill stands over 350 feet tall, is able to withstand winds in excess of 150 miles an hour, spins one rotation about every 3.8 seconds, and can individually create 1.8 million watts of power. That's enough to power up 1,300 homes. Now I wanna make it clear, these things were biblically huge, right? I'm standing a football field away and I still couldn't get the full wind turbine in the frame of my camera. Just think about that. I'm a football field away and I still couldn't do that. But actually it is their sheer size that makes them economically feasible and efficient in the first place. So let's talk about the most iconic part of a wind turbine, which ultimately makes all this energy generation possible, the blades. When the blades are spinning, they make an awesome sound that you just kind of have to experience for yourself. It's completely humbling. Now this is a seven ton blade, which is still fairly heavy. It has to be able to withstand the winds that we have out here. Uh, but you do want to make them as light as possible. So we use hydraulics to turn the entire blade back and forth in or out of the wind. That's how we control our speed on these. Um, again, they spin 16.3 to around 17 revolutions per minute, all controlled with the blade angle. So that's important because we don't want them to overspeed or to wear out prematurely. And we want to keep it in the proper speed range for the generator as well. 
We have Vestas V80s here, which mean they have a 80 meter diameter swept area. But Vestas now makes a V164, so it's twice as big as this. It's big enough you can drive a double-decker bus into, for comparison. <laughs> that's incredible. That's yeah, just, that, that's so sick. So I thought this was smart. They even have little drainage ports to let out built-up condensation inside. Now, when the turbine is spinning under normal conditions, it contains a ton of rotational energy which needs to be converted into electricity. That's the purpose of a windmill, right? Three 130-foot blades spinning at 17 RPM is no laughing matter. So inside the head of each turbine is a massive 690 volt generator, which is connected to the blades through a gearbox. This is a 17 and a half ton gearbox. So the purpose of the gearbox is your blades are not spinning very fast in the wind. We're only doing about 16.3 to 17 revolutions per minute. This takes it through several sets of gears and brings it up to 1800 plus RPM on the high speed side. So, and the reason that's important is because it hooks into the generator over here. And the generator is designed so that it has to be over 1800 revolutions per minute to induce a current or produce electricity. Voltage comes off at 690. It runs through four cables to the transformer. This sits in the very back of the nacelle. And that steps up to 34,500 volts or 34.5 kV. I'd like to point out that stepping up the voltage to 34.5,000 volts right at the head of the turbine is actually really smart. And that's because transmitting energy at higher voltages reduces energy loss through heat. That's why power lines are at such high voltages. So essentially PSE is using a fairly efficient turbine. For perspective, this is what 34,500 volts looks like, granted a lot lower power than the turbine. It's a voltage which requires serious high voltage insulation as seen in this high voltage wire which goes down to the base of the turbines. Man, I need me some of this stuff. Luckily, our private tour took us where no tourist has gone before, inside one of the bases. Walking inside, it was a complete power trip. You can look up and it's a straight 300 foot climb to the top, which apparently Andrea does as part of her quality control inspection, so she gets my respect. One thing I found fascinating is the fire suppression system they use inside of their windmills. Andrea told me they use sulfur hexafluoride, which is an extremely dense gas that suffocates both fire and electrical sparks. Anyways, that 34.5 kV travels down the cable next to this ladder and passes through this computer which analyzes multiple variables, including wind speed and power output. That power then leaves the windmill and joins up with the power from the other 148 turbines on its way to your house. So we have about 13,000 customers here in Kittitas County, so that would be the first stop for the power, and then the rest of it would go over to Western Washington to our customers there. We power about 60 to 70,000 homes with this site. 180,000 houses if we ran full power all the time. The fact that one, just one turbine can power up to 1,300 homes, that's amazing. But if you ask me, the magic of the situation, the real magic lies in what a turbine actually is. You see, turbines don't produce power. They transform it. You see, wind is just a mass of air with velocity. That means it contains kinetic energy. When wind collides with the blades of the turbine, it imparts some of this kinetic energy into the blades, creating rotational kinetic energy. At this point, blades turn the generator, which transforms the rotational energy into electrical energy. I want you to think of it like this. Wind upstream of the turbine's moving, say, 20 meters per second, and wind after the turbine's only moving 15 meters per second. And coming out of the middle, aka the turbine, is an electrical power equivalent of the differences in kinetic energy between the first mass of air and the second mass of air. So essentially, wind turbines act as a shining example of the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Energy is not really created, it's just transformed and borrowed. So in reality, wind turbines exchange wind speed for electricity, literally. Really though, it's amazing that the entire process of power generation is fully automated. You can see on the top of this one here, it's an ultrasonic sensor, and it's measuring wind speed and wind direction and telling the computer system internally, which is taking averages, and it decides what angle the blade should be at for optimum production. It also decides which direction the turbine should be pointed. This one's going into low wind idle now. You see the blades flexing backwards as it slows down. So this one decided, hey, the wind's below nine. My generator's not spinning fast enough. And so it turned everything offline and it will just sit there and wait. 
Now let's touch on windmills and their interactions with birds because as it turns out, birds don't always see those blades contrasting against the sky. So there are multiple things you can do to help make windmills more bird friendly. One of them is to paint your blades contrasting colors so they're more easily to see. And there's a plethora of other things that PSE actually incorporates, which Andrea talks about. The original turbines in the 1980s spun much faster. They were very loud and they were not as bird friendly. So that's one of the main reasons for slowing down the RPM is to make them more bird friendly, but they also last longer and they make less noise. Uh, the entire layout out here is based on wind measurements, but also bird migratory patterns. So it was laid out um, in some areas, you can kind of see that patch of pine trees out there. It's given wider spacing there because that's an area that birds utilize more frequently. There's areas along the ridge line with wider spacing because hawks will ride thermals up and over the ridge. So modern wind facilities are required to do two-year pre-construction surveys to look at how wildlife uses the facility. And that just makes it a much more wildlife friendly facility in the long term. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't my, my long-term plan, oh but I, I love it here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did not know this, this is Janet. She ruined shots. She ruined oh shots. I'm sorry. I was like trying to get out of the way over there, and that was all I was <laughs> On that note, it was time to go. Hopefully this gives you a new appreciation for wind power like it did for me. The fact that we can extract all of this energy out of the environment is mind blowing, you have to admit. I want to thank Puget Sound Energy as well as Andrea and Janet and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to learn something new. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below because I read all the comments. Lastly, if you're a fan of nature, go check out Mitch Pittman's Instagram account to see his take on this entire tour. I'll leave a link to his Insta down below. Thanks for stopping by, and don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to Plasma Channel. I post to other social media, and feel free to check out our various other episodes. With science every two weeks, you stay classy.